look back in hindsight Everything is 2020 In hindsight We make mistakes, we're learning from the In hindsight be your today and your tomorrow In hindsight is so much clearer now have you ever wondered how tapping into your innate creativity can transform your life and business? Well, look, today we're diving into the world of creativity and self-discovery with Susie DeVille, the dynamic founder and CEO of the Innovation and Creativity Institute. Susie is not only a trailblazing business coach, but also an accomplished artist and author of the award-winning book, Buoyant. The Entrepreneur's Guide to Becoming Wildly Successful, Creative, and Free. Her experience and insights make her the perfect voice for today's episode of Hindsight, the podcast where we focus on self-discovery. Good morning. How are you doing, Susie? I am terrific. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for coming on the show and, and giving your insight. I really appreciate it. I like to think of myself as a creative at heart. I know when I was younger, I used to draw and then I stopped drawing so much and started taking, photo you know, doing photography. And now I, tr I really try to apply some of those things, some of that creativity while I'm at work. So I'll bring up some of those stories as you give us more insight, but enough about me. Tell us a little bit about yourself. <laughs> Where are you calling in from today? So I am in a mountain resort community, which is my hometown. It's called Highlands, North Carolina. Oh. We are about 4,100 feet up in elevation in the Blue Ridge Mountains. And um, wow. it is absolutely um, spectacular. I, I mean, it's just beautiful and lovely. <laughs> huh? Spin the camera around. Let's see. Let's see the. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Let's see your view from the window. No. Well, <laughs> I would show you a clump of rhododendron that would look like it belongs in Jurassic Park because oh, wow. we have had so much rain this summer. Mm, um, yeah. So we're a temperate rainforest. We typically do have quite a lot of rain. This year has been rather interesting in terms of more. Um, and the greenery is lush and mm. spectacular. So we're the opposite. It's really dry. It's really hot. We actually had a fire pretty close to the house yesterday. I was driving back uh, in town and and my, my friend called me up. He was like, hey, it's a fire. You might want to go another route, right? So thankfully, the firefighters got out there, did their job, uh, knocked it down. I went out this morning to walk my dog. I know we talked about dogs a little earlier, but uh, <laughs> I walked my dog, checked out the scene. Fire trucks were still there, just making sure nothing pops back up. Uh, but, you know, I just want to send kudos out to the fire, the fire men and women over here in California. We need well, some we'll, of that rain. We're going to send here. the clouds your way. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us a little bit about yourself, Susie. Yeah, so um, I grew up in this beautiful place where I live and mm -hmm. um, grew up in an entrepreneurial household. So I um, worked in the family business, you know, from middle school on up. <laughs> and learned from my father, who was an artist, an engineer, and an entrepreneur, um, and went off to college, got a degree in anthropology, moved to mm. Boston, and then London, worked in the academic publishing industry, came back to North Carolina, and um, began working in nonprofit management, launched two different nonprofits. Um, then got into the real estate world uh, back in 2001. So I have been a licensed broker since then. Started my own company during the Great Recession and um, did quite well. Sold it. And then um, meanwhile, I had been working to build something called the Innovation and Creativity Institute and I was also coaching and consulting with entrepreneurs and nonprofit leaders. Um, and in the middle of all of that, I had uh -huh. my nuclear winter period, <laughs> which oh, okay. was 2008 to about 2013. And um, that's kind of the genesis of everything that we'll be talking about today. You touched on a lot of things, a lot of, I say you touched, <laughs> how do I say this? <laughs> I want to talk about anthropology. How was that? Did you did you uh, have an opportunity to explore that degree? You got a degree in anthropology. Mm -hmm. So did you mm -hmm. go out and dig some stuff up? 
<laughs> well, I did, as a matter of fact. In, well, and you think go? it's hot where you are right now. Uh, try the Piedmont in North Carolina shoveling dirt, you know, mm. for an hour day mm. in the summertime. <laughs> I was in a little place called Hillsboro, North Carolina, and we excavated something called the Okanichi Town, which was an old Indian village. Um, but I was primarily wow. focused on cultural anthropology. That was much... Um, I mean, it was captivating okay. to me, all of it. Uh, and anthropology, if mm -hmm. anybody's out there wondering if that's a discipline they want to pursue, I cannot recommend it highly enough. It teaches you how to understand the world through multiple lenses and multiple perspectives. So all of your strategic and your um, synthesis work is very rich and reflective of the entire human experience and not our own mm. little sort of corner of the world. Right, right. Awesome. I'm glad you I'm glad you expanded on my limited because I hear anthropology, I think dinosaur bones. That's and, you well, know, that ancient was what... civilizations, right? <laughs> <laughs> so when we went out at night to 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 bars and people would say, What's your major, of course? <laughs> And yeah. I'd say anthropology, and they'd say, oh, right, that's like bones and stuff, right? And I'd be like, well, right. yeah, that's, there's a little bit more to it than that, but yeah. <laughs> no, that's pretty, and that's pretty awesome. I, I really did not think about it because there's so many Jurassic documentaries and things like that, and they kind of talk about it. And actually, what's my man's name? Who's the guy? Uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. No, oh. no, 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 not Raiders of the Lost Ark. Yeah, it is Raiders of the Lost Ark. Harrison Ark. Ford. Harrison Ford. I mean, hell, yeah. he was a, he was a professor who was teaching about it, right? So I should have right. caught on right there. Right. Uh, so anyway, was I'm glad you you got an opportunity to do that. Uh, if anybody's interested in anthropology, Susie says, "Hey, thumbs up, go for it." Right. Oh, it's you'll <laughs> love it. It's fascinating. So you went on and you you started doing real estate. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that period. What made you get into real estate? Well, um, so my then husband had uh, grown up with a father who had started a real estate company. So that's how he got interested in it. And then mm -hmm. he and I started doing some investing in properties in our community. And I was signing contracts that I didn't know how to read, mm. which really bothered me. So I said, you know, I'm just going to go get my license so that mm -hmm. I'm a very smart investor. And I'll know how to read these contracts, never intending at all to become a real estate broker and actively list and sell properties. Um, mm. And within about two weeks of getting my license, I got a client <laughs> out of the blue <laughs> Wow! <laughs> and showed them around for one uh -huh. day. They went, they were from Atlanta. They had come up for the weekend. They drove on the way back to Atlanta, they called me and said they wanted to put an offer in on one of the homes that I had shown them that day. Mm -hmm. And so that resulted in a closing, which I, it was one of our company's listing. So that means I got both sides of the deal. Okay. So when I got that check, <laughs> you had to rethink and, things, right? <laughs> and I looked at it compared to my nonprofit, you know, leader salary yeah. Uh, it was quite, there was quite a big difference there. So, mm -hmm. um, I thought, and plus I was just naturally great at it. Okay. Okay. Um, I studied like a fiend. I, you know, not only just got my license and learned the law and all those things, but I studied the marketing aspects, the investment aspects, all of the strategic, um, parts of the industry. And I got, I, but I just had a knack for it. Mm. Um, most especially with the investing side and the negotiating, creating great contracts. Yeah. Um, and so I just started to, you know, do that full time and mm -hmm. it grew into this huge uh, business for me. Wow. Um, and, um, and it's fun. And I still do this work. I, I probably do real estate about 15% of the time. Okay. And my coaching and consulting work and my work as an artist, um, about 85% of the time, but it's, it's still just enormously fun to do. All okay, right. So you did it. You love it. You built the business. You sold it. 
Did you look at the offer? It's sort of like you looked at that first check and was like, oh, I may have. What made you decide <laughs> to sell your business? <laughs> well, I will tell you. So I was building the Innovation and Creativity Institute in parallel okay. this whole time. Mm -hmm. And when the bottom fell out of my life and I lost everything financially, my marriage came to an end, my health went kaput, and I had to reinvent myself and start over. My mm -hmm. first inclination was, oh, I'll just do what I always do, which is just work really hard. I'll just work yeah. my way out of this hole that I'm in. Right. And that did not work. For the first time in my life, I could not outwork the, the hole that I was in. I had mm. to then reimagine a new life and find the path to success and freedom in a whole new way. Yeah. And that's how I began to take all of the research that I had been doing on innovation and creativity and blending it with my experience as a nonprofit leader and strategist mm -hmm. and my own experience going on what I call a creative rebel's voyage, which is when I learned how to express myself in paint, sketching, collage, et cetera. Okay. And I was this person who, like you described yourself, that you were sort of this quasi creative person. Mm -hmm. And then you pushed it, you know, you just sort of parked that part of yourself. Mm -hmm. um, it was my sort of renaissance that was rooted in tapping into my creativity that propelled me into an entirely new life. And out of this hustle and slay and grind myself to success mm -hmm. and went into what inspires me, what brings me alive, what fuels my um, passion and my sense of self and sense of the world. That was a very different stance. And but it's available yeah. to everybody. That's what I really want to emphasize to all of your listeners is that creativity and being an artist is for everyone. I can prove to you in 10 seconds that you're an artist. <laughs> uh -oh. And once we embrace that and just sort of take it in and understand, okay, this is available to all of us. Mm -hmm. And it is also, in my opinion, the skeleton key to unlock absolutely everything that you want to have happen in your life. Awesome. So let's go in hindsight. Let's go back again before we get to the nuclear winter. You said <laughs> you said your dad was an entrepreneur. Well, you said you grew up in an entrepreneurial, um, an artist. Your dad was an artist. And what else? What was the other one? So um, entrepreneur, engineer and artist. Engineer. OK. You know, I, <laughs> that's funny. Um, I, I studied drafting. And so I worked with a lot of engineers. And I was like, uh uh. No, <laughs> I just didn't like math that much to really jump into being an engineer. But I did uh, electrical, structural, architectural drafting. But uh, that's as far as I took it. Then I went to the army uh, in hindsight, right? But anyway, that's another story. My, <laughs> my question <laughs> for you is you, you are an artist. You mm -hmm. say you're an artist. What, what is your medium? Or what, what is it that you do as an artist? I, you specifically, yeah. I I sketch. I do mm -hmm. watercolor. I do acrylic painting. Mm -hmm. I do collage. I do mixed media. I work in inks. Um, I I'm also a poet. I write short stories. Wow. I write nonfiction. Mm. Um, so I'm kind of immersed, in, in, and I'm just keeping everything very open to what a new medium might offer or take what path it might take me down. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm always looking to play with new gear, get involved in a new medium, see what something can do or take a medium that I already know and push yeah. it in a different direction. It's very, very fun. What did you start off doing as a kid? Were you just um, doing sketches or what? Uh, don't say water paint. <laughs> I, I did not believe until, so it's 2024. 
Uh-huh, I did uh-huh. not believe until about 2016 uh-huh. that I was an artist. Mm. Even though I grew up with a father who is an artist, was an artist, um, did all kinds of incredibly creative things, mm-hmm. expressed himself through Ikebana and um, creating this and Matt just an, just incredible experience inside of his retail shop. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, So it was around me all the time, but because I could not sketch something that looked like something in the real world, I did not consider myself an artist. You got, yeah, I got you. And that's the trap that we all fall into. So follow up question. Last question. I promise you on your artistic (laughs) <laughs> background and say now what made you in 2016 recognize that you were an artist and then follow up how can you prove that someone is an artist in 10 seconds so my journey into exploring myself mm-hmm. my own creative path was sparked because i had been doing research since 2000 and five Mm -hmm. on innovation and creativity and Mm, i had been studying it from a kind of like an academic perspective Mm -hmm. because i was curious about how it could drive results for my coaching and consulting clients and i was just passionate about learning as much as i could the more i learned from this kind of theoretical place in a balcony, the more Mm -hmm. I had hunches that if I could tap into this energy myself, it would have transformational power and healing power in my life. And so I started just taking little tiny steps in that direction. Um, Even during my nuclear winter period, which was, you know, it helped contribute to my pulling myself out of that. Mm -hmm. But I started in 2016 ish taking lessons in a very formal way. So I took private lessons and began to have these artistic mentors give me enormous guidance and technical um, insights and ability. I could challenge you to do what's called a blind contour drawing. Mm -hmm. Um, You could take an item on your desk it could be a pencil, it could be a stapler, it could be a, you know, coffee mug, an item, put a piece of paper in front of you, put your pencil in the middle of the page, and study this object. You're not allowed to look at your paper. You are only allowed to look at the object. And I would give you 20 seconds to sketch something wild while you're looking at your object. Do you want to do it right now? I'm doing it right now. Okay. But don't cheat. Don't look at your paper. I haven't looked at it yet. I'm still looking at this mouse. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) So I can draw anything? Yeah. But I can't look at the paper. I mean... Yes, you cannot look at the paper. That's the only rule. And the, okay. uh, and, and the goal of this, <laughs> by the way, if anybody's playing along at home, the goal of this is not to create something that is an identical replica of the thing that you're trying to sketch. So just like, and there's no way to do this wrong. <laughs> so it's, it's a, almost a meditative moment that you merge with the object that you're sketching and you kind uh-huh. of enter into a new zone. Gotcha. Did you do it? <laughs> I, I mean, I, I did. Let something. me see because they have very cool. So first, first this was the mouse, <laughs> the oh, mouse. I didn't, do, I didn't do really good on the mouse, but then I drew this and I was, I was impressed because I didn't even look at the paper as I was drawing that, uh, so, that little face there. <laughs> Blind contour drawings are so cool because, first of all, there's no pressure to make it look like the real thing, which is how our brains mm-hmm. are trained, 
right? Right. You get to then just relax into it and have fun. Then when you look at your paper and, and, and I give people more than 10 seconds, I will give you like two to three minutes to do a blind Mm -hmm. contour drawing. Mm -hmm. Um, but here's, what's cool. If you do it again, set a timer for three minutes and just focus on the thing. Yeah. And keep your pencil down on your paper and don't look at it. These drawings, when you have a chance, when the timer is up and you look at it, they hold a very interesting kind of energy. The line has a very cool, unique current that runs through it. Mm. And there is something that happens when you cross this threshold into this place of, of creating where you're in a state of almost suspended animation. And what right. happens is, is that you're tapping in now to intuition and your creativity back channels that don't come online when we're in left brain, like our trains have to run on time mode. Mm, yeah. So it's about the experience much more than the thing that we're creating. I'm going to do a three minute one after the show is over. Okay, perfect. And, and... And see, I've never done that because, you know, as I was trying to do it while you were explaining it, obviously I started drawing what I was looking at Um, and I didn't, I didn't do a good job, but when I just said, oh, let me draw this happy face, right. That came off pretty, pretty uh, easily and it. it, Yeah. Okay. I like it. Yeah. Do it again without me, you know, in your ears, um, because it it really does have a big meditative aspect to it. That's key. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I like it. Okay. All right, now we have fun. Now it's time to go <laughs> go deep a little bit and let's talk about the nuclear winter. And what yeah. what happened first? What started the snowball effect of this nuclear winter period in your life? The crash of the markets in 2008. Of course. Yeah. Of course. And I um so the household was real estate and my mm-hmm. husband was is a contractor. So we had both <laughs> industries get just sort of kneecapped at the same time. Right. Um, and that really sort of um, didn't, it's a combination of setting things in motion, but also revealing cracks that were already there. Hmm. So that um, just, you know, the businesses went kaput. Mm-hmm. Um the finances went kaput, the marriage went kaput and my health went, you know, kaput all. Mm -hmm. So it just kind of was this series of things that happened. Um, even though it was certainly not my most favorite thing in the world to experience, (laughs) I would not trade it for a million years. It put me on the path that I'm on now. And it Mm -hmm. revealed to me an entirely new way to live and work. And so if anyone is struggling right now or is in a place of transition and you're in fear or or, or you're stuck or you're overwhelmed, there is a path out to the life that I think that you perhaps have been destined for. If you're Mm -hmm. willing to go through not knowing and having some uncertainty for a little while, In my opinion, the key, which if you get a copy of my book, there are exercises that will take you right through this process. There is a key to coming back home to your authentic self, which is the path out. Mm -hmm. And it is fun to go on this adventure. So it is scary. I get it. But it's Mm -hmm. also Mm -hmm. exhilarating and Mm -hmm fills you with an entirely new sort of focus and lease on life. I'm glad you put that in the book and we'll, we'll jump to the book in a second. Uh, but that message is important. You don't have to have a housing crash and marriage end up in a little bit of ruin and <laughs> then have bad health in order to take advantage of some of these steps. It doesn't have to be that tragic a situation. Of course, no. Right. And here's the thing. Most people are in kind of, um, what is it that Thoreau says? Most men live lives of quiet desperation. Mm. It's, it's, it's a lot of that 
Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. it might not be spectacularly failing right. like my my situation. <laughs> yeah. But it yeah. could just be ennui. It could just be drudgery. It could just be the color has drained from my life. I don't want to do what I'm doing anymore, but I don't quite know what I want to do next. Mm-hmm. So it could just be you're itching for more um, play and fun and passion and joie de yeah. vivre and adventure. Mm-hmm. And you maybe don't know exactly how to pursue that. So when you wrote the book, Boy, well, okay, let's let's not go there. You said in the book that you have some steps on how to get through. Mm-hmm. Did you use those steps? Did you use your experience to kind of summarize what you went through? And then here's the bigger question where I really wanted to get to. We see you on the other side. You're thriving. You're doing well. But we know you went through this period, this dark time. How long did it take for your mind to shift from where you are being a a victim, in a sense? I don't know if you ever got there to to reclaiming yourself, to reclaiming and start to set goals and get back to this entrepreneurial, this um, creativity and innovation journey. Like how how was that for you? And you can get as deep or as shallow as you like. It's a, such a great question. Um, and I'll tell you, um, so the bottom fell out in the fall of 2008. I would say it was probably the summer of 2000. God, it wasn't even that long, actually. Mm. Summer of 2009. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and what I was doing, I was walking around cause I was in this, um, complete freak out mode because I was trying to figure out how to pursue this marriage dissolving mm-hmm. and right. what do I, how, you know, we have three kids and I'm just like freaking out. So I was at the, the, the track next to where our house is, where the, the, there's a, um, ball field there and there's a track that goes around that was walking around the track and I was trying to figure out in my mind okay how do I sort this out how do I protect the kids what's the right decision um is this all going to just be just one horrible thing after another (laughs) and I walked over to where the bleachers are Mm -hmm. and I can remember even what the what the metal on my hand feels felt like right now I could feel it yeah. And I put my head down for a second and I just closed my eyes and I imagined the very worst case scenario. It's, it's, I'm alone. I'm sitting on a curb. I have no home. I have no possessions. Mm. I have no, no family. i I'm just there up by myself and Basically, what I did was force myself to look into, like, the chasm of, like, the worst possible scenario. Mm -hmm. And I let myself sort of look around in my mind's eye. And it was not, again, it was not my favorite thing. But I was okay. I was was now at the bottom in this chasm. And I could look up Mm. and see... Oh, I can do this. I can mm-hmm. get out of this. It's, I don't know how yet. Wow. And I don't know how long it's going to take me. But I, right. I can survive the worst of this. Because I've seen it. Been there. Mentally walked myself through it. Um, now I can, I can start building. And that changed mm. everything. And it wasn't overnight. But I now... And I actually ran home from the track. Because I remembered something in Jim Collins book, good to great Mm -hmm. that I knew had a piece of the puzzle for me. And I literally ran all the way back to the house, which was like two and a half miles and burst into the house and got this book off of the bookshelf and looked it up. And I realized that I needed to start to get very clear Mm. about what I needed to, conf- what, it's, there's a story in Good to Great about Admiral Stockdale 
And the key learning is you've got to confront the brutal facts and never give up hope. Mm. So you don't live in la la land, but you're not Eeyore either. Just, Mm -hmm. just wallowing in misery. So you confront the brutal facts and then you make the plan and you stay in a position of optimistic hope. Um, And that's exactly what I did. I mapped out on the kitchen counter on a legal pad, the first steps of how I was going to address everything Mm -hmm. in my life. And I tell you what, you say this, love the story. I'm visualizing. I told you I just went to the park this morning uh, and I can see you sitting on a bench out there contemplating and getting up and sprinting home like you've got that that inspiration and it's time to go to work. Enough of this time to go to work. So I appreciate the story giving us some insight on that. Now, you got home, you wrote out step one on your plan on the on the kitchen table. How long did it take you to to achieve step one, get to step two? Because it's a process. It wasn't like you figured it all out that day and you went to work. You still oh, had to right. go through stuff, right? And and go ahead. Because I don't what reason what I'm trying to do is build on you you have the hope, you're not giving up. But it doesn't mean it's gonna be easy after that. There's still no. some work that has to be done. Gut wrenching. <laughs> yeah. But um here's the thing that happens. When we tap into our intuition. Mm -hmm. courage rides shotgun with us. Mm -hmm. And when we have the combination of intuition and courage, we take bold action. And when we have bold action, we ignite synchronicity, Mm -hmm. the magical things that start to happen. And this is exactly what happened to me. But I first, with that legal pad, the first thing that I did was get everything out of my head that was freaking me out. Mm-hmm. So I love that. how to do with the, how to deal with the divorce, like all the things that were icky and murky and slimy and scary. Um, yeah. You know, how I'm going to make a living, how I'm going to support my son, you know, all of this stuff. And then to the right, so I made my list and then to the right of everything on the list, I wrote down who, who are my people? <laughs> Who, know, who knows how to solve this? Who knows mm-hmm. to, how to recommend the first thing that I can do here? Okay. And some of those things were books, like the Good to Great book. Some of those things were things that I had learned wow. in uh, my master's program. Some mm-hmm. of those things were things that I learned as I had begun to tap into my creativity. So I had, and I was it was, I was sort of in the river of trust. Mm -hmm. And when we're in this space, our brain seems to kind of open up and problem solve in a, in a much more unique way. So I wrote down, you know, what my first steps would be and my who's and what I didn't know and started to work that list. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't a straight path. Right. It was this way and then down and then I'd get, you know, so, um, but so that was summer of 2009 by the following summer, I was deciding to start my own real estate company in Mm. the middle of (laughs) the great recession and with $250,000 worth of debt. Okay. Okay. Let me ask you something. No. Uh, did you, okay? Did so? Did you? Did you do? Uh, I'm in your business now. You can say I I, I plead the fifth while I decline to answer because I had another lady on here. And she she told me she was uh, that I interviewed. She she was in two million dollars in debt. Right, same kind of same situation. Mm-hmm. You know, marriage was failing, and a lot of the stuff was kind of leveraged on different things. Right, so did were you? Did you just work and do real estate and got a big $250,000 check and you were done? Or did you do some other legal finessing to kind of work, work with it? I'm just curious. Oh, you mean to, to get out of debt? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, it was through real estate closings for Not sure. Or. I oh, yeah. love it. I, love I it. was, I was debt free and financially free in three years mm. from, from launching my company. Yes. Ooh, launching and selling. All right. 
So there's a plan, real estate. I've heard it from too many people. Um, I'm going to have to cut this interview short so I can go and get my dog. No, like, <laughs> so real estate, I do. Let me just plug the industry for a second because it yeah, has yeah. a bad reputation, right? Uh -huh. If you are a solid citizen and you care more about your client's interests than your own, and yeah. I'm not advocating that you're a doormat, but you are advocate, you are your, they are your primary concern and you take mm -hmm. incredibly great care of them and you give them the best of your market knowledge and expertise and strategy and focus and advocacy. Mm -hmm. um, you can have a, a tremendous amount of fun and get very, very wealthy. Yeah. So if you are willing to study and learn how to be a, incredibly excellent at it, mm -hmm. I think it's one of the best paths for anybody to pursue. As long as you have in place your ability to take care of yourself and not go down the slippery slope of believing you have to work 60 hour weeks to be successful yeah. because that's not true. Yeah. Okay. I love it. Plug, plug, plug real estate. <laughs> no, but more importantly, real estate with empathy. So have that, have that knowledge one, be prepared with the knowledge and then be willing to su support people and take care of people's uh, desires, expectations and stuff like that. When it comes to real estate, obviously. <laughs> And awesome. <laughs> get extra training in how to be a fierce negotiator. Mm, okay. And Alrighty. I don't mean killing the other side. I mean crafting a very powerful deal that's a win for everybody because that's the deal that's going to close. Okay, so now we know that uh, Innovation and Creativity Institute was on your mind for a while. Which came first, the book, Buoyant, or Innovation and Creativity Institute? Um, Innovation and Creativity Institute came first. It was mm -hmm. born from um, a class that I was taking as part of my master's. Okay. So I was in um, a class in 2005 and was introduced to a company called IDEO, which is out in your neck of the woods, um, Palo Alto, California. Mm -hmm. And it that particular um, company was what sparked my immediate passion to learn everything I could about innovation and creativity. So I, uh, I began in 2005 really studying and learning and folding it into my work mm -hmm. and um, was doing real estate as a parallel track to that. So what can your, what can your clients, your pupils, <clears throat> your Padawans, what can they learn uh, or what can they expect? Not necessarily learn. Cause I'm sure there's a lot to learn, but what can they expect? if they were to work with, with you in this institute? It, it depends on what it is that they want to have happen. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. a lot of my clients come to me who are hard charging entrepreneurs and or are visionary leaders, C-suite leaders, um, and they are completely burned out. Hmm. And they want to reclaim their lives and a lot of times also their health, but they also want to scale. They yeah. also want great wealth and success. Mm -hmm. And they believe initially, like I did, that it was, they, they just want me to just tell them how to set the strategy to scale and then just execute. Like, just mm -hmm. give me the plans, give me the roadmap, Susie, and I'll go do it. <laughs> right, right. And so... And I do that work. Like I just had somebody come for a VIP coaching experience a month ago here to Highlands. Mm -hmm. And we created her roadmap to 20 million in annual rec recurring revenue. Mm -hmm. um, so I do that work. I will help you scale. But I will start with something that's very foreign to you that will make you probably a little frustrated and, and sort of obstinate with me mm -hmm. initially. <laughs> um <laughs> But what, what we do is begin, we, we go back. I start to help you see the difference between what is truly the authentic you versus what is everybody else's expectations. And we reclaim hmm. the fun and play and things that you used to love to do before life got too busy. We bring all of that in. 
I take you through a lot of different kinds of exercises. Some of those are written. Some of those are through um, art adventures of certain kinds. And, mm -hmm. but it's very customized. If you're working with me one-on-one, -on -one, I am really dialed into you. Yeah. And I am extraordinarily great at spotting where individuals particular mindset limits are and what needs to be shifted wow. in terms of how the brain is communicating with you and mm -hmm. how you're believing certain thoughts that you're having. So, um, it's a very deep experience if you, if you do one-on-one, -on -one. Mm -hmm. um, I also do workshops. Um, I have a workshop coming up um, pretty soon that I'm going to be doing. It's all about boundaries. So there's lots of different ways that you can plug in and start small in the shallow mm -hmm. end of the pool. You can take a half a day workshop. You can take a one hour webinar, but you can just get the feel or you can just sign up for my newsletter and see what I'm writing because everything that I create is a desire out of a desire to help somebody who's in a dark cave somewhere mm -hmm. find enough light to get out. Right. Wow. I tell you what, it sounds like an amazing first exercise. It made me think of, I told you I did drafting mm -hmm. and, <laughs> and how I hated my teacher. So the, our first <laughs> exercise, <laughs> we would just sit and have to write like lettering, we had to do lettering for hours. Like the, fr I'm like, when are we going to get to learning? You know, this, we had to do it for hours, but you know, what was funny. And this was, I was like 19 years old when I was doing this. What was funny is I did take it seriously, even though it irritated me to do it. And that was why I got hired at the engineering firm that I was working at, at the time because of my lettering. So it's weird, right? You take those, those first initial ones because whoever's doing the classes yourself, Susie, trying to get people to understand who they are, their authentic self, and not what you're made to act like you are, you know, based mm -hmm. off of just life and work and mm -hmm. relationships and all this other stuff. So that is a, a beautiful um, first exercise um, that I think I want to try to explore myself. So I'm going to start off with the newsletter. Okay. I'm going to see what you're, I'm going to see what you're writing about. Uh, and, because and you do, I'll tell you do you, a lot of you do a lot of study and you you find a lot of knowledge, so I oh, know I'm going to be impacted. So I'm relentless. I cannot yeah, stop. Yeah. I love it, and I love to share. I love to go off, whether it's via a book or across the Atlantic Ocean, to yeah. have experiences and then bring back whatever I have learned and share it with everybody. Because I awesome. that's my goal for everything that I do is I want to mm -hmm. help set people free to be right. their highest and best versions of themselves and to mm -hmm. love their lives. I love it. I love it. You were about to say something. I kind of cut you off. Do you remember? No, <laughs> it's kinda, I know it was kind of in the flow and I apologize. That's okay. <laughs> I don't normally do that. Um, <laughs> all right. So get to find out yourself and then you can build off of that and determine what it is that you're trying to do. And then here's some ideas, some recommendations on how to get there. I love it. Buoyant. What made you sit down and put pen to paper and go on this journey of, of authorship? So I had wanted to write a book ever since I was a little kid. Mm -hmm. And what I discovered was that during my experience, during my time in the fire, was that I was learning things that were going to be incredibly helpful and beneficial to anybody who's on an emotional, physical, financial gurney like I was. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I thought, I'm going to put this into a book so that I can reach back and help as many people as I possibly can. Mm. And so when I decided to sell my company, which was um, at the toward the end of 2017, um, we closed in, in the early part of 2018, and then I went to the beach with a box of books, <laughs> uh -huh. and I began studying and writing and thinking, and, and it took me, you know, two years to get a first draft, mm -hmm. and it was um, very organically written. 
And then okay. I took, um, I, I started working with a publishing and editorial mentor mm -hmm. to really hone and, and edit it down to a core. Yeah. Then I brought in another, so I had like a hundred and something thousand words, got it down to 55,000 or so, put another 25 in it. And, and so the crafting of the book was an expression of my heart, soul, mind journey, but also I wanted it to be a work of art. I wanted yeah. people who read it to love the words and how they were written as well as the content. Hmm. And I've had so many people, I'm so fortunate, um, who have said that not only was it the book that helped them change their entire life, but that they keep in their mind certain phrases and certain things that I write about in the book because it, it stuck into their soul. And I, that's mm. thrilling for me. Yeah. Yeah. So how was the, you said about two years to get mm -hmm. your draft. How was the experience for you just going back and reliving some of the, the things that you went through and, <clears throat> and how did you capture, I guess it's probably a little therapeutic, but how did you use that essence and apply it to the book? And I'll say this because I'm trying to write, I'm, I'm not trying, I'm actually about 30 K words in right now. So I'm Great. writing one myself, right? Perfect. But the, the experience is unique and there's always different reasons why people write books. But I want to know, for me personally, I love what you said about the words. Mm -hmm. I want mine to be easily read because I've read, I've read a lot of books. Some of them are super easy to read, very deep, and you, you, you get it. Mm -hmm. Some of them are amazing, not, you know, books of information, but they're so difficult to read. I guess I asked a whole lot of questions. How did you take the experiences that you went through, use that, mold your, your book, work with the editor, get the right tone, like don't answer all those questions, but give me a little feel on how it was for you writing the book. I gave it a lot. Just give me a little feel. Oh, sure. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> so I loved it. Okay, I nice. just adored it. Yeah. Because again, going into my geeky, nerdy, loving to learn, loving to teach self was incredibly exciting. Yeah. And I wanted to codify and understand. I knew that if I really wrote this out, mm -hmm. I was going to codify the path out of hell. Right. Mm. And, and, and I knew that, and, and I actually wanted to really understand it better too. Yeah. Because I knew by writing it, I would have to be crystal clear and sharp about exactly what I did, exactly what happened, exactly what I tried, what worked. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I did. I went, I, I started mind mapping. Like, what did I do? What, how did that impact me? What was the key? And I was looking for, little nuggets of um, pockets of genius in the kinds of things that I was trying and doing and mm -hmm. how I could take that and take somebody else through the journey so that they could have the same benefits. Mm -hmm. So I would write early in the morning. So I discovered, I talk about something in the book called your creativity um, circadian rhythms. Okay. And I think it's very important for all of us, but especially if you're working on a book, to understand mm -hmm. what your maximum point of access is to your intuition and your ideation and imagination and your writing acumen. Mm -hmm. For me, I thought it was like between 5 a.m. and 9 a.m. And okay. so that's when I wrote. I then discovered later when I was getting papers to my editor and I was on deadline, I had to get up earlier to make it happen. Mm, and yeah. I discovered that between 3 a.m., and I'm not saying everybody, don't, don't keel over on me. You don't have to get up <laughs> at 3 a.m. to find it because it's different for everybody. Right. Mine just happened to be between 3 a.m. and about 9 a.m. And okay. I, what I wrote at 3, 4, and 5, and 6 a.m. was 
unbelievable. Yeah. I was tapped into something, and this is going to sound like magical thinking, but I was tapped into something well outside of myself. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, have you ever written, you said you wrote non, you wrote poems or you write poems and <laughs> some nonfiction. Have you ever, <laughs> this is embarrassing. Have you ever written something and then look at it years later and be like, God, that, that was amazing. I wrote that. I've done uh, that. And I look and I'm like, well, how, where did I get that from? And I think I was probably tapped in. Have you experienced yes, that? Yes, it happens to me literally yeah. every single day. I love it. I need to get to the every day. It it's, surprises me. Yeah. Because here's the thing. I can teach you uh -huh. how to make that magical moment a regular, repeatable, dependable mm. resource. That's right. exactly what this is. And it's like something that we're connected to that is this higher level of understanding and intelligence that is available to us all the time, but we're mm -hmm. too burned out, too exhausted, too full of Cheetos, too much in the grind to reach mm. into it. Mm. If but that ain't it's motiv there. It is there. If that's not motivation to, to get on a call <laughs> with Susie, I don't know what is, right? <laughs> I'm going to ask you one quick question. It's not a quick question, but I need you to make it quick. Sure. Okay. What strategies do you recommend for overcoming obstacles and staying motivated during challenging times? I think so, you're the perfect person to ask this question. To. I can tell you the key to the universe is understanding how to heal and protect your energy. Mm -hmm. So what do I mean by that? That mm -hmm. means we need to understand what fills the well for us. Mm hmm what, as Paulo Coelho would say, what inspires us? That is when we breathe in things like beauty, art, nature, being with those that we love, doing what brings us alive, that fills us with an energy resource and a willingness that is absolutely required in order to do challenging things. Mm. So that means if you want to start a new habit, or you want to have a challenging conversation <laughs> with someone that you know is going to be a toughie, but you got to have yeah, it. Right. Or you um, want to do something, you want to take bold action, but you're afraid. Or um, you want to plan and, and live a European vacation that's four weeks long. Um, and, and you're terrified um, mm -hmm. because you're going to go alone. And, and, and so all of these big things that we all dream about are within our grasp if mm -hmm. we have the energy. So if we, if, we, if we show up with a full tank, we have a full tank of a sense of it's not only possible, but it's possible for me. Right. So any kind of decision, any kind wow. of string of challenges or things that we've dealt with, and we're trying to find the next path, the next best action. Mm -hmm. If we start first with energy, filling our tank up, then we're going we're gonna to hang in there when it is scary, when it is yeah. lonely, when it is not working. And that's a lot of the time. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Definitely. I wholeheartedly agree. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I appreciate it. Hey, so I asked you a few questions and thank you so much for answering them and sure. you know, giving your perspective and insight. But is there something that you'd like to talk about that we haven't covered just yet? Well, I think it's important to help people understand that when you are at a crossroads and you're trying to sort out what is it that I really should do? Mm hmm it's important that we have time on our own to hear ourselves think mm. because we have truly mag magnificent built in intuition. We are masters at ignoring it or mm. drowning it in work or 
overeating or over drinking or whatever it is our buffering of choice method is, mm -hmm. we're fabulous at turning it off, mm -hmm. but it's there. Mm -hmm. So the, the beautiful, exciting things that are calling to us are absolutely within our reach. And if we can remember that we're not going to um, get there by doing what everybody else expects us to do. <laughs> wow. It's just, it, it, there are times where we have to stand in who we truly are mm. and walk in that energy. Mm -hmm. because, and, and people, a lot of people aren't going to get it. A lot of people are going to poo-poo it. A lot of mm -hmm. people are going to say, oh, my God. I mean, when I started that real estate company in the middle of the mm -hmm. recession, people thought I was nuts. Right. <laughs> and, right. You, and you have to be okay with, you know, you just have to yeah. not care, right? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. for people who are looking to take a, a new step wow. or um, make a dramatic shift in their life, mm -hmm. then – Begin with what it is that you know that's true to you and listen to what your intuition and, is saying and how it's guiding you and mm. ignore everybody else. Right. Right. Powerful words. Powerful words. Yeah. You, well, I'm not even going to touch that because that's, I'm, I'm believing in your, <laughs> your capable words. Uh, so hopefully everyone took that message. That was that was amazing. Um, and now, if people did take that message and, and they want to know more about you, uh, where can the listeners, the viewers, where can they connect with you and learn more about your work? Sure. You can go to my website, which is innovationandcreativityinstitute.com. And mm -hmm. there you can sign up for my free toolkit, which has all kinds of goodies in it. Um, mm -hmm. You can um, join my newsletter or you can connect with me on social channels through through the website. Um, mm -hmm. Or if you want to get the book, um, the easiest and, and best place at the moment is through Amazon because it's on discount. It's a it's 55 percent off right now. So it's a great deal. If you go to Amazon, you grab a copy of the book. Yeah, I think I got it. And truthfully, I haven't started reading it yet. I'm in the middle of of all these other uh, books in uh, yours. I'm going to actually have to read it. Oh, because right. I, I know I usually and I that say makes that, me insanely happy. <laughs> no, and I'm going to tell you why. <laughs> Dang it, because it's not making me happy. I drive. <laughs> I'm usually on the road like two hours, maybe one and a half hours one way. Right. So it's easy for me to turn on an audio book and just absorb. The only thing that I don't like about audiobooks while I'm driving is that there are certain things that come up and you want to remember it. You want to write it down. And I miss that opportunity. So I absolutely have to read your book. I have to sit down because I believe that there are going to be a lot of things that I need to jot down so that I can remember and take those strategies and different steps in order to get to uh, the point that I want to get to. So I'm yes. excited. I'm very excited. And just go, <laughs> um, go with your own. There's no, you know, we don't have to scale right. Everest by Friday. So right, you can, right. you can just <laughs> go at your own pace. Here's what's going to happen though. You're going to start to feel different in Ooh. a very short period of time. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be a sense of momentum and mm. the power of accumulation beginning mm -hmm. to happen because mm -hmm. you're going to be reading and you're also going to be doing exercises, but your brain, your subconscious mind is going to be working on stuff while you're sleeping. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. and it's fun. It is so fun. I think you'll oh, really I, have a good time. You got me excited. I hope you're all excited out there uh, and, and <laughs> grab the book buoyant. Hey, so thank you, Susie. Thank for you. sharing. Yeah, for sharing all your incredible insights on self-discovery and creativity. Uh, it's been inspiring to hear about your journey and the strategies you've developed to help others unlock their full potential. And to our listeners, thank you for tuning in. Don't forget to subscribe to Hindsight the Podcast so you won't miss any episodes. And until next time, keep making those decisions that lead to your ideal life. Thank you so much, Susie. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. 
Hey, thanks for joining me here on Hindsight, the podcast. I'm your host, Lee Jones. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I know I did. And while I have you here, why don't you take your mouse and go over and click on that subscribe button? No, no, not right there. Over to the right. T- no, no, down, down, right, right there. Boom. Thank you. Now, thank you for subscribing to Hindsight, the podcast. I'm your host, Lee Jones.